Okay, everybody, I'm going to hand over to Roger. You can talk about a memo operator. If you're paying attention. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, I'm going to talk about a memo operator. Um, I'm going to talk about a memo operator. I'm going to talk about a memo operator. I'm going to talk about a memo operator. I'm going to talk about six weeks ago, when Jay Fogg sent out an email to the language group, language development group in Dialog, asking who would be interested in go watch this film. It was just coming out at the time. Its title is The Man Who Knew Infinity. Uh, it's about um, the Indian mathematician Ramanujan and the English mathematician G. H. Hardy. It's uh, based on this book with the same title by Robert Conigal, which came out in 1991 or 2. 91. I read it uh, for the first time when it first came out, and I'm, I'm just finishing reading it for the second time. And it's well, well worth reading, and I look forward to watching this film with my colleagues this coming uh, Wednesday. So when the email went out from Jay, uh, Fiona Smith immediately replied, Ah, Mr. 1729, I'm in. <clears throat> Does anyone know what the 1729 refers to? Uh, good. <laughs> it's the first, uh, smallest integer which can be written in two different ways as sums of two cubes. And the story was that uh, uh, Ramanujan was staying in a rest home in Putney, and Hardy went and visited him by riding a taxi cab. And the taxi cab had a number of 1729. So it must have struck Hardy because he was thinking about it, and when he went in to talk to Ramanujan, he says, oh, this taxi cab has a very unremarkable number. I hope it's not a bad omen. And Ramanujan immediately said, oh no, it's not bad omen at all. It's, it's a very special number. It's the first, it's the smallest number which can be written as, in two different ways as the sum of two cubes. He knew that immediately. And uh, Littlewood, uh, a colleague of theirs, when he first heard this story, said, every positive integer is a personal friend of Harman Yujan. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Nick Nikoloff, uh, a colleague of ours, found a paper by uh, Steve, Stephen Wolfram of Mathematica fame and other fame, written on occasion of this film. And in the paper, he said that uh, uh, there's a paper that Ramanujan wrote with Hardy concerning the partition function. And I'll explain what a partition is in a minute. But the partition p function counts the number of partitions for a given n. And he said that he, uh, Wolfram kind of boasted that in, uh, in the Wolfram language, Mathematica, you can compute partition P of 200 instantaneously. Uh, yeah, and this this paper is uh, an important paper in pure mathematics, uh, published by the um, London Society of Mathematics in 1918. Okay, so that sounds like a challenge because the, you know, in 
Wolfram language can compute that function instantaneously. So the number of different ways of, uh, the number of different partitions of 200 is uh, 3 trillion. Yeah, 3 trillion, 972 billion, 999 million, 29,388. And the way uh, Wolfram wrote about it uh, is that uh, before uh, the Hardy and Ramanujan result, you can't compute it very easily. Okay, so What is a partition? A partition is a, is a way of writing an integer as a sum of a vector. So all the partitions of 1 is the vector 1. Partitions of 2 would be the vector 2 or vector 1, 1. And 3 can be written as 2, 1, uh, 3 itself, 2, 1, and 1, 1, 1. And the order in the vector doesn't matter, and so on. Okay, so the partition function is a, is a count of the number of different partitions. Now, I happen to have done this before to, to uh, count the number of partitions, to compute the partition function. But I, I didn't use uh, the hardy ramanujan result. I use one based on uh, Euler's pentagonal number theorem, first proof in 1750, more than 160 years before the hardy Ramanujan result in 1918. <clears throat> and that's this thing. Oops. <coughs> you can see that it's recursive because P of N is defined in terms of P of N itself. And it's uh, highly multiply uh, recursive which I'll show you in a minute. I can um, <coughs> define that in dialog APL as follows. It's a recursive function if if one, you know, if the omega is zero, one, or negative, then it's zero and uh, and one for omega equal to one. Otherwise, it's just recurse, you know, you go recursively. <coughs> and rec is a sub-function that implements all these smaller values. So, pn of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 are as follows, and pn of 30 is 5, 6, 0, 3. So, uh, for example, <coughs> PN of 30, wow, yeah, uh, it's not big enough. Oops. It's computing. So, because it's highly multiply recursive, even for 30, it takes a while to compute. And I'm using one of these tricks of presenters. When it's taking a long time to compute, you talk and distract the audience <laughs> until it comes back. So, it's not recommended that you try PN of 200, which is what uh, Hardy and Ramanujan computed in 1918 and what uh, Stephen Wolfram. What did they use? They, uh, well, they prove a theorem. Hardy and Ramanujan prove a theorem, which makes it 
instantaneous. And my claim is that uh, I don't have to use their theorem. I use, you know, despite the fact that it's multiply recursive, there's a thing, a device, a mem the memo operator, as it happens, that makes it feasible. OK? So there, there's the answer. So why is, why is it, why does it take so long? Because it's highly multiply recursive. So if you, if you say PN of 200, 200 is, is not, uh, is not uh, less than 1, or 200 is not uh, less than or equal to 1, so it will go to this recursive part. And the first thing it does is it, it says rec of 200. So rec of 200 is this two-row matrix, which is, which is not too big, but it's going to recur on each of those elements. So for 200, it's going to generate this matrix and then recur, you know, recursively apply to each of them. That's what that del each does. And then so it's going to recur on 199 and then 195 and then 188, 178, and so forth. And for 199, it's going to apply rec to that and there'll be 198, 194, and so forth. Okay? So it's highly, highly um, multiply recursive. So what can we do? I remember uh, in J, there's a memo operator. There's also one that in, in the DFUNS uh, website. For now, I prefer this one because it's simpler. Because all it is is that is that described in these two sentences. Okay. It's a monadic operator, so it applies to a function. F of n is the same as f itself, but may keep a record of the arguments and results we, we use. And it's good for uh, multiply recursive functions, which we have here. So, I can define it easier as a D operator. By the way, the contents of this uh, talk will be will appear. I think sometime next week is a dialogue blog entry, so all the details will be there, and I probably we probably will submit it to Victor. So it's a as a short D operator, and it uh, well first of all it satisfies the main thing, which is that Pn of m on an argument is the same as Pn without the m. Okay, so it gives the same result as the function without a memory operator. So Pn was, from the previous slide, is defined as this thing. And what the operator does is it redefines it by inserting the stuff in red. So unlike, unlike John's uh, memo operator in the defense uh, website, this one is more restrictive, but it's easier for me to explain, okay? Because it redefines, it, it requires that the function be in the form, you know, with one diamond, where the stuff on the left of the diamond is the basis, the base case, and the stuff on the right so, it, so the, it requires that the function has one diamond, and then the stuff on the left of the diamond is the base case, and the stuff on the right, the recursive case. Okay? So PN satisfies the requirements. And what, what it does is it sticks in the stuff in red, which is the uh, cache of the values. This uh, very table with the variable name uh, capital T. <clears throat> so what it does is it uh, creates, initializes a table, and then just calls a function itself. 
And then when it's done with the recursive part, it stores the value in capital T. Oh, sorry. Yeah, stores it in capital T so that the next time it comes in, if it's already in the table, then it just retrieves the value in the table, which is this part that I highlighted. Otherwise, it would go to, actually go to the recursive part, computes it, and then puts it in the table. So PN of 30 gives the same answer as required. And it's much faster with the uh, memo operator. Faster by a factor of uh, 140,000. And on uh, 200, PN with the MAMO operator on 200, it takes uh, about 4 milliseconds. So for a suitable definition of instantaneous, we can compute uh, PN of 200 instantaneously in APL. And that's the number of partitions. Same as before. It's amusing to figure out how long it would have taken, how long PN of 200 would have taken without a memo worker. Okay, so um, we can define an associated function PNC, which counts the, counts the number of function calls. Right? So the number of function calls would, would be roughly how long the you know, PN of 200 would, would take. Right? So in the base case, you'll call the function just once. Otherwise, in the other cases, once for your current call, and then the sum of uh, each of the recursive calls. Okay? Alternatively, we can just count the uh, you know, using uh, lexical global variable capital C, which counts the number of calls as you go into the function. Okay, so you can see that, uh, and, and PNC is in the form that the memory operator can operate on because it, it's got the base case, one diamond, and then the recursive, recursive case. Okay, so PNC each, PNC memo each, giving the same, same result. And PNC1, which is a, a different way of computing the number of function calls. So the number of function calls for an argument of 30 is 2.59912E7 uh, for 30, and for 200 is uh, 7.57E47 function calls. So for 30, uh, we saw before that it took 45 seconds. So for 200, it would take roughly 1.3E42 seconds. That's a pretty big number, or uh, 40, 34 years. Uh, by which time the computer, you yourself, the universe would have not just crumbled to dust, but it'll be uh, a quark, what they call a quark soup. beyond the heat death of the universe when entropy would have taken over everything. <coughs> ah, okay.
good time. Now, uh, the PN function works for much larger arguments than 200. Uh, a result of J, which has uh, uh, extended decision arithmetic. So PN of 1,000 using a memory operator still can be computed faster than, uh, no, about the same time as human reaction time. 52 milliseconds, and it's that number, exactly. So the memory operator is a, is a very useful device, which uh, allows you to do actual computations on mul multiply recursive functions. No, it works on uh, more commonly known uh, multiply recursive functions such as the Fibonacci numbers. Okay, so this is a multiply recursive definition of the Fibonacci numbers. And uh, so even for Fibonacci, for arguments that aren't very big, you see a big difference in in uh, the time it takes with mem, you know, without memo and with memo. And the uh, memo operator works on uh, nameless func, you know, anonymous or nameless functions. You see here, is Fibonacci defined without first naming it, but uh, the memory operator, even this model, can handle it. And as well, and as well uh, it can handle functions with non-scalar results, uh, and also dyadic functions. An example of that would be uh, combinations. Uh, so For example, 3COM5 generates all the combinations of size 3 of the integers from 0 to uh, 4. This definition is an updated one from one which appeared in uh, Gilman and Rohn's APL and Interactive Approach from 1973. So it's doubly recursive. Now, of course, the result is not a scalar, but a matrix. But uh, uh, even so, the memory operator can handle it. So 3COM5 without the memo is the same as 3COM5 with the memo. But with the memo, it's uh, a lot faster. I'm done. Any questions? Normally. Uh, if your function is monadic with an electro argument, it still works on um, it. Takes a vector argument. It's not with my model. Okay. But if, if we were to implement it in the system, it would handle it, but it if the vector doesn't repeat, then you're not going to well, gain a, very much. There's a fun function which effect will repeat. Yeah, then. The aggregate function, which grows faster than any other function. Yeah. And that would be a cool to see, because that would uh, take quite a while. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it will speed it up very much, though. Because uh, of. Are you a betting man? <laughs> <laughs> Um, for, for, for a suitable definition of not very much. Yeah, I think 
<laughs> because, you know, for example, five Ackerman five yeah. is a humongous number. Yes. Simply you store that many digits, you know, with, with exhausted resource of the computer. But you could build a table that has, you know, the arguments and every time you find this combination you have a dictionary you can just keep it into this table. Yeah. If you don't have the arguments, you put them in the table. Yes. Going. That is the idea. And but with the uh, operator, the, the ID that we came up with last year, that you can just append to it. And then we'll yes, 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 yes. But you still have to compute it the first time. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I thought I thought about it, but I yeah. not very deeply because I knew that the Ackerman function is, has other difficulties besides being multiply because. Okay, thank you very much.